Hey, let us begin today, uh, August 29th, the uh, Carpenter Working Group. Uh, let me share my screen. So today we've begun the uh, recording. If nobody has any objections, if you do, let us know. Uh, but moving on, uh, we're going to start off with project updates. So I believe this was two weeks now uh, ago, we've released uh, Carpenter V1. This would be both for the uh, for uh, Kubernetes 6 Carpenter as well as for the AWS provider. Um, yeah, so if you've had the opportunity or are excited, please give it a try. Let us know what you think. If you run into any issues, uh, let us know and we can help you through navigating any issues you may have. Uh, yeah, any questions on that? Alex, are you planning a V1? Or you gonna hang back? Were you asking me? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're planning kind of the GA of the managed version. I'm not sure exactly on what the versions of the, like the release are gonna be, but generally, yes. Cool, and then an Azure coming soon. Cool. Anybody else uh, from Azure side want to give any project updates? Anybody else want to add anything here? If not, then we can move on to RFCs. Not on the Azure side, at least for now, the development has been kind of suspended for a little bit, but we're restarting it now. So hopefully some you know, better news soon. Sounds good. Cool. Then moving on then to our first RFC. Uh, Eviction reasons. Cameron, you want to kick us yeah, off? Sure. Uh, the first three RFCs are all mine. So um, this first RFC, uh, this is a, a new uh, functionality change to uh, Carpenter. Basically, the motivation here is uh, Carpenter, when node claims are disrupted, uh, it evicts pods. Uh, it evicts pods with a reason of evicted pod, which does not describe to the user uh, why the pod was evicted. It does not describe to a cluster operator why the pod is evicted. You'd have to go do some sleuthing on your own to go figure out uh, was it disrupted due to some sort of consolidation? Was it disrupted due to spot? What is it disrupted due to some sort of other issue? Uh, you're not going to know unless you look. So what this uh pull request does is adds a new node uh claim condition on the the node claims status and it does that with this disruption candidate status here and we basically encode in the reason why the node is getting disrupted when we begin the process so that later when we can evict the pod we can just use the uh status condition as the reason uh that's how this works uh, we've been running this in our clusters as under a forked carpenter for a couple months, and it's been very helpful and helped us discover, uh, you know, some issues with uh, consolidation and really helped our users understand why their pods were being evicted. Um, so that's a bit of background on this. Uh, I don't know if anybody has had a chance to take a look at this yet. Um, but I would love feedback. This is something that we've been using in Indeed's production environment for uh, about a month and a half or two months now. So it was funny because uh, I had a conversation with, I think, Jason, who's also on the call, about this like maybe a month back at this point. Um, about like potentially adding the reason we're disrupting a node as like at the taint value that we attach um, so that we could look up the taint value as part of like the eviction flow and then we could fire a metric on it, um, which I assume is basically what you're, I mean, you're effectively doing that, but with a condition, right? Like it's just yeah. kind of like a question, like where does this land? That Yeah, that's an implementation detail. I'm not opinionated on the condition that seemed like the natural place where to put a status message. Makes sense. So you're basic, I haven't looked at this PR, but you're basically just like, adding a metric as part of the eviction flow that has the reason attached to it and that's it. 
Yeah. So you could also just describe the resource and it would also show the reason why the node claim was being uh, disrupted. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, we, we had, like I said, we'd kind of gone back and forth about this and we basically decided not to do it until somebody started asking for it, but I can obviously see why it's useful. Um, and now that you're asking for it, it may be a natural time to do it. Um, yeah. I don't know, Jason, do you have any thoughts? Because I know we discussed this a little bit. Yeah, I'd honestly have to go back and revisit my notes on exactly, because there were some technical reasons too we wanted to include it through the, the taint uh, rather than any other. Um, basically, be, that way we could... It was like reduced rights, so maybe. For termination. Sorry, I think you're either I'm behind or you're behind. I think it was to reduce rights, if I remember correctly, for like certain operations. Yeah, I, I'd have to go back and review. It's been a, a little while, but yeah. I think that's something uh, when we're taking a look at this PR, we can... Yeah, if I if I remember correctly, it was like, okay, if we, if we spread it across the node plane one, we have to do a back reference lookup, which I know we're doing anyway with the termination grace period within the node termination flow. So like, maybe not terrible. But then the other thing was, I remember like... We could basically save like some subset of rights for adding, uh, like, cause we, we, we already write to the node as part of the disruption flow on taint. So like, we would just not change the number of rights we do there if we added the value to the taint. Whereas if we added an additional condition on the node claim, we are like effectively doubling the rights. Yes. Um, I don't know. If, yeah. I don't know how tangible it really is, but it, that was one thing that we discussed. Okay, well, that's valuable feedback. Yeah, the code you're showing right here is the the writing back to the node claim, and it is yeah an extra um, API call. Yeah, I mean to be clear, like certain conditions would still result in an additional API call because like expiry and interruption now are just doing a straight delete. So to give them the like give the proper context into. Because they just rely on the the termination controller to actually add the taint as part of the like the initial thing that happens, uh, so they don't actually have the context on like what like the no termination controller at this point doesn't have the context into what deleted it if it's not added ahead of the deletion operation. Right. So we'd have to add rights there, but I think like for anything that's disrupted gracefully, so drifter consolidation, like we already are doing a write, so like we would basically save rights on those oh. operations. We didn't even really add rights, right? Because at that point, the taint is being added before the termination controller gets invoked. So we never do that right inside the termination controller for that taint. That's that's what I'm saying. But I'm saying that we do have to write. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. It's you're saying neutral. the right would happen anyway. Yeah, that's yeah. true. So actually, yeah, it's, it saves all the rights. It also yeah. makes it nice because you can uh, differentiate like user initiated because if it doesn't have any reason attached to the taint, you know for a fact it was a user initiated deletion or some other process that is outside of Carpenter. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, right now, this just emits a generic message if there's no condition. Oh, cool, um, yeah. I think that's all I had on this. Yeah. Sorry, were you going to say one final thing? I was just going to say we'll have somebody look at it. I think I think we're generally receptive to this idea. It makes sense to me. Okay. Yeah. And if we want to change it to using the taint value, that sounds plausibly easy to do. Um. Do we want to look at the next one? Yeah. I think I'm the first three here. Cool. That was the only one with code. These are going to be RFCs. So this first one here is uh, maybe the more contentious one. Uh, this is about consolidation and should how much control should users and and when I say users, uh, how much control should node pool resources have over their own consolidation? Um, I propose a couple different ideas here. Um, Basically, the motivation is that uh, one size fits all consolidation that Carpenter does right now for a node pool does not make sense for every type of customer. Certain customers don't want single node consolidation. Certain customers don't care about multi-node consolidation. Uh, basically, those are just completely different type of workloads. If you are running something that's like 
very heavy compute, you maybe don't care about single node consolidation because all that does is try to find you cheaper instances and you're not looking for cheaper instances. Same with multi-node consolidation. If you're doing heavy job type workloads uh, that are like one shot, multi-node consolidation is your bane. You don't want multi-node consolidation because that's gonna destroy all your job's progress and start over. Um, Carpenter doesn't really know anything about workloads. You can do do not disrupt. Uh, we do that for job type workloads right now, but that just turns off consolidation entirely, which is not what we want either. So I propose a couple different uh, options here. I am completely open to other options. I don't think this is um, fully enumerates all the possibilities or what or includes what maybe you guys are thinking in the AWS side. But um, basically, there's a strong desire to be able to say, we think this node pool shouldn't have a certain type of consolidation, or we should at least be able to say hint to Carpenter in some way that uh, using like pricing factors or something like that, some other mechanism, tell Carpenter that uh, different types of consolidation are not optimal on certain node pools. That's basically the, the overall ask. Uh, and then if you go into the individual options, option one is price controls, which is like the least um, intrusive, least control for users, but gives Carpenter the most flexibility in the future. Uh, option two is sort of give users like uh, an enum that lets them control the types of consolidation that can happen on their node pool, but doesn't give them any tunables. And then option three is the um, option where you try to expose everything to the user, give them a ton of knobs, give them a ton of controls. Um, this is my least favorite option because I feel like that's too close to what Cluster Autoscaler did. And then there's a lot of um, lessons learned from that, but uh, I included it for the sake of completeness. So I'm just sort of like looking for feedback. Um, this is a problem that we have in our clusters. We have different type of customers that all the different types of consolidation are not necessarily great for, and we don't have great ways to answer their use cases. Uh, and I'm hoping that you guys have some other clever ideas beyond what I've just posted here. So what's like the the staged approach? Like, like I guess I'm curious. Like, I think we've we've talked about price improvement threshold. I think there's a PR out from Matt on it or something. Yep. Maybe maybe it's just this RFC. I don't know. No, um, I do have a PR open for it too. I recall that, and then yeah, I know uh, we got busy with like V1 stuff. Yeah. Out, so we hadn't gotten back around to it, but um, I recall that was there, and I think everyone was pretty receptive to that idea. Like, how close does that get y'all, or is there still like a bunch that we need to? I think the biggest uh, limitation that I can see coming up that hasn't been verified yet with uh, improvement threshold over the uh, like price improvement threshold is the um, uh, issue with multi-node consolidation. Uh, as that PR is implemented right now, it would also impact multi-node consolidation and probably like severely restrict it, even though we do want to keep multi-node consolidation around uh, because there are hidden costs associated with those nodes and smacking them together into bigger nodes is better. Um, but that's not going to be like reflected from Carpenter's pers perspective. So it would probably block that if node overlay got finished or, uh, was implemented and we had the ability to like assign static costs to like each node, then that would probably solve that issue is my thinking. Yes. Uh, thank make you. Yeah. The node overlay. That's, that's exactly what I was going to say as well is I think maybe the price, um, threshold stuff with node overlay, those two things together, maybe get us there. Uh, but we obviously don't have an implementation of either of those working together, so we don't know. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm curious, like, uh, I think both of those are, like, pretty aligned as a team on on those going mm -hmm. forward. And so I, I could imagine that, like, we, we start there, we see how close that gets y'all, and then we, we improve from there. We had to, just to, to, like, add an additional context, I think, we had talked a little bit about... Um, reasoning about like pod disruption in terms of like some cost value which you could then like add to the price of the thing to like get some idea about how expensive it is both in terms of actual price and in terms of like disruption cost 
to that like would require like heuristics on like how long you expect a pod to stay up on a given node though right yeah it's kind of it's it's complex it's a hard problem yeah <laughs> I'm just saying we talked about it, but yeah, it's it's like it's more complex than just yeah, I mean making it out to be there. Because yeah, we like even use the um what is it? The there's like a cost or I forget, there's some label or annotation that you can attach to a pod, but that just affects our ordering. It doesn't affect like whether we decide to terminate it or not. Um or you can like assign it. So this pod's important, but yeah. That's like high in the sky goal. Like if we could properly if <laughs> we could properly model like how expensive and bad it is to like terminate something beyond just like full block, that would probably be ideal, but getting there, I think maybe. Yeah. yeah I don't want to boil the ocean in order to figure out how much it's going to cost to replace a node. That's also not helpful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this, I mean, I'm fine if this just sticks around as a, as a, a placeholder, because we all agree, this is a, an issue we would like to solve in general. Um, and if we want to wait until the node overlay and price thresholds gets there and we can reevaluate and see if that is the answer for this, that would be great if that was the answer for this. What's um, the status on node overlay? But yeah, is I, that, don't, I don't know what the yeah. status on that is. I don't know if anyone here can even speak to that. So, so I think we're kind of, at least from the maintainer side, or at least we'll strap for resources. I think we'd be open to like somebody in the community that was interested in pushing it forward. Um, we can come back to it like in a, I think in a long poll, maybe, I mean, when I say long poll, like maybe a few months at this point. Okay. Uh, but if somebody was interested in taking it up, like, I think we're open to that as well. Like, it's not like we want to block in the design because I think we think it seems reasonable, but it's just okay. kind of so okay. basically, Ellis was pushing it. Uh, he's on leave. Uh, thus, it's basically paused uh, for right now because just due to resources, available resources, effectively. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's understandable. Okay. Yeah. Is um, there an open? There's an open PR for it though, right? That we could potentially look at. There's an open RFC PR. Oh, it's just an RFC. It's not uh, okay. Yeah. There was like an initial stab at doing the. the um, like instance type caching and like it basically like moving instance type generation and caching to the like client side from Carpenter's perspective, like into the neutral space yeah. so that they could basically tee up doing the overlay on the, on the neutral side. Um, I think that got auto closed due to stale out, but we could reopen it and have somebody take it up or take a look at it again. Okay. That's interesting. I don't know if we can commit to that, but we will look at that for sure. That's interesting to us. Yep. Okay. Um, that's good for this. And then this last one. Um, uh, this one is a bit more focused. Uh, this is just about multi-node consolidation specifically. Um, there's already been issues opened by other users basically describing this problem, but uh, I rewrote it all out in RFC format just in case people wanted to see the RFC for this. Uh, on this, I'm mostly looking for alignment. If everybody agrees, it's okay. And also, I have questions about the drawbacks. Um, basically, the problem here with multi-node is uh, it's not aware of, of node pools, and it's not aware of architectures. And in clusters that have many node pools or that support multiple CPU architectures, multi-node consolidation does not function as designed. Um, the sort of basic solution proposed for this is just partitioning. Um, partition the nodes based on these uh, various differences and then perform the same multi-node consolidation logic inside of these different groups. Uh, the major drawback that I realized when I was writing this up is that Carpenter uh, encourages users to you create multiple node pools if they say have like reserved instances, right? Uh, so you would create like a node pool for your, your spot or general on demand uh, compute usage, your general workers, and then you'd create another node pool for your reserved with a different weight so that uh, you could use reserved instances first. And if we were to partition multi-node consolidation on just node pool boundaries, that would mean that multi-node consolidation wouldn't work 
between those two node pools, even though they might be identical in terms of requirements. Uh, I don't know of a simple way to work around this because node pools requirements are pretty coupled to the spec and it's not easy to compare two node pool resources to each other and say like, this fits within the set of this node pool, right? Or if they're overlapping, right? There's, there's set and union logic here, right? Um, I don't know if there is a better way beyond just trying to brute force compare a node pool to see if another one is even compatible with it. And if we want to pursue that, or is that a non-issue? Do you really not see users even really doing node pools in that type of layout? That's sort of my question. Um, that's in the drawback section of the stock. I think it's a use case. Um, for sure. We've definitely seen people do it. Um, I've and also... Some, yeah. My I've... personal thoughts on this are that it, if we start using node pools like for cases, like you need to separate logic on like a node claim disruption and stuff to have like a difference, like, like a single node consolidation versus like different multi-node consolidation by node pool, that's going to naturally conflict uh, with what we're trying to do here. Uh, to fix uh, multi-node consolidation across node pools, right? So the less uh, incentive a user has to break up node pools to solve arbitrary problems, uh, the less this is going to be an issue, right? Yeah. If, yeah, for example, if you can't do consolidation across multiple node pools. Right, yeah, you're basically saying if users are encouraged to have as few as node pools as possible. Then this becomes less of a problem, yeah. Yes. That's generally my preferred preference and what I've been trying to like steer all of our efforts toward is having as few node pools as possible to avoid problems like this, uh, just in general. So. Yeah. Um, the, the node pool partitioning thing remains no matter what. Um, however, the CPU architecture problem does not. So it does not have that drawback. So I think multi-node partitioning on CPU boundaries in particular, is kind of a no-brainer. Um, it's kind of an oversight that doesn't do that. I don't know if people have any thoughts on ways we can work around the the drawbacks with the comparing node pools that might be identical or overlapping them. Yeah, so you basically say we could do some like quick checks. Uh, across node pools specifically to validate which ones are possible to like work with each other and then partition the the consolidation decision making as a result of that. Yeah, I mean it's easy to do a naive check, right, and just compare all the different various requirement fields, but it's easy to uh, like introduce a, a one new label into a node pool and Carpenter doesn't really understand the impact of that label, right? That could have massive scheduling implications. Yeah. So. You know, a, two node pools that are identical except for like one label. How do you know if those node pools are really overlapping or not? Node overlay also like really complicates that too. I think. Can you as it was denied? Yeah, yeah are you talking about an additional <laughs> a label? Like I'm, I'm trying to think yeah. of what specific scenario you're talking about. Like a way to be added that has impact that wouldn't like survive the naive check that we're describing. Uh, it, it can just have a significant impact because of how you customers set up their workloads, right? Like just customers can require labels for uh, affinity and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it may not even be specific to the cluster, but uh, Carpenter doesn't know anything about what customers are doing until the pods are pending. Yeah. So that's the hard part. Carpenter can't really intuit the meaning of some of the requirements. Yeah, this is the one that needs the most thought, obviously. <laughs> this is the most complicated one. Uh, I need to read this. I haven't read it personally. I think some people in our, I, I don't know if anyone else here has read it. Yeah. Um, I think that is, it, you know. Anyway, I, I think the the half of this that doesn't have all of the, the complications is the CPU architecture uh, partitioning. I mean, I don't know about you guys. I We rarely see customers that have 
uh, deployments that are designed to be spread out across architectures. We see people with multiple uh, with deployments that support multiple CPU architectures. That's certainly a pattern we see. But typically, the user prefers a CPU type. They might just be like, oh, it can run on the other one as a backup. Um, and you know, usually, the application has been developed on AMD, or it's been developed for Graviton, right? It's not like targeting, let's try to get 50% on you know, uh, Linux, and let's get 50% on the Graviton uh, arm, right? That's not a workflow that I've ever seen. So the partitioning on the CPU architecture, I feel like, is a straightforward improvement. Um, the node pool, less so. That sounds okay. Okay, that sounds good. I think we can just put a pin on this one and then move on to uh, ODCR. Yeah, I'll give an update on this one. Uh, let's see if I don't have anyone else that's contributing to it on the call anyways. So, um, yeah, so I've been pushing some updates here. Um, Thor and I, Thorbin and I have kind of been taking ownership over this one and we've been making progress. My like tentative goal is to get the RFC merged over like either by tomorrow or like early next week. Um, cause I think we kind of have closed on a lot of open questions. So if anyone on the call has like additional thinking, I think pretty much all of our thinking is in the RFC now. Um, and we've kind of closed on all the key decisions that we needed to make. So um, like high level is we're going to introduce RDCRs and, and targeted support. Um, open ODCRs will have support, but they will be targeted during the launch. So, which I don't think makes a tangible difference really to anybody. Um, like if you just using open ODCRs, you just tell Carpenter to select on them and we'll like target those ODCRs for launch, um, even if they're technically open instance match criteria. Um, we'll drift on that, we'll consolidate to them, we'll prioritize ODCRs during provisioning. Uh, this is the API, it's gonna be pretty minimal to start, ID owner ID tags. We'll probably, we have some like fast falls in mind in terms of capacity res uh, reservation groups, being able to select on capacity reservation groups and then all the ODCRs within those reservation groups, um, which is not there right now, but I imagine we'll get asked for pretty quickly, but we'll not, we'll maybe scope that into a follow-up. Uh, capacity blocks will be followed up. Um, I think there was one other thing in the non goals section. Oh yeah, like there was like automated attaching and detaching of ODCRs, which is kind of interesting. Like if we had launched, if Carpenter had like launched an ODCR or if it, sorry, if it had launched an instance type um, and because we're not doing open matching, if it launched an instance and that instance is now like eligible to be in an ODCR because there's availability in that ODCR and the instance just happens to match the instance type in AZ for an available ODCR that you've selected on, um, rather than relaunching the instance and like kind of like refreshing it and because we could affect it, we would effectively consolidate that instance to the ODCR and relaunch it when in fact, all we could have just done was just like do an attachment to the ODCR and not had to relaunch the entire thing. So there was a fast follow on like, okay, can we be smarter than consolidating and replacing? Can we just attach, which we hadn't, um, we're not covering with them this either. Um, we, we're going to introduce this, yeah, with this API that Emmanuel is showing. Um, there'll just be an additional capacity type. Uh, and uh, I think the only other thing was this would fly under an alpha feature flag to start. So um, this will be under a capacity reservation feature gate. Um, and that'll enable the API to work and the uh, the feature, yeah, the feature to actually function like it would for a feature gate in upstream. Uh, I think that's it. So yeah, I think RFC hopefully merge like with feedback sometime early next week, um, if not this week. And implementation is kind of already actively ongoing. We've just been making progress on this doc as we've been going. Um, so should hopefully see something tangible soon. Cool. Uh, any questions for Jonathan on that? 
If not, I think we can move on to uh, community questions or, oh, I guess we, never mind. We have another RFC. Uh, I'm just going to put this in. We talked about this earlier. This is the price improvement threshold uh, PR at the moment. It's an implementation PR, but uh, if anyone has any thoughts about the implementation, uh, it's in draft because it doesn't have any tests or anything, but the uh, the actual implementation is able to be used. So, uh, but if you have like thoughts about like uh, if this feature sounds useful or like if you're concerned about it being on at the node pool level versus the node claim level, uh, those are things and comments that would be uh, useful feedback to have. Matt, did you say you're testing this like in dev? Seeing how uh, yeah, we're getting ready to deploy uh, Carpenter V1 uh, along with this change uh, to start giving it a spin and kick the tires. I've been uh, backlogged on a couple other things for the last couple weeks, but getting back on this now. Cool. So wait, is this this isn't going to is this going to prod or it's not going to prod? Uh, if it works in dev in our dev environments, then it'll eventually make its way to prod. Yeah, okay. But I feel I have a feeling we're going to test this uh, for like a week or so at a minimum in uh, QA environments first. Cool. Just where we have like a, a lot of like user workloads, but nothing that's going to like blow up the company if it catastrophically fails. Sounds good. Cool. And then, okay, now on to community questions. It doesn't seem like we have any. Uh, I guess we'll do uh, I'll ask one one more time if does anybody have any community any questions um that we can answer if not then we can call it a day okay I will take that as a no uh thanks everyone for joining uh yeah hope to see you next time around in about two weeks take care